Hi everyone, it's Joe from For Bomb Pens Only here with Johnny, uh, and we're in the company of Dame Joanna Lumley. Um, Bond fans will know her for her role in Majesty's Secret Service. So, Joanna, I think that'd be my first question. How does it feel to be a Dame? Well, I was going to say <laughs> <laughs> that one of 12 of Blofeld's Angels of Death up on the mountaintop, never in a million years would sort have of dreamed of becoming a Dame. It's terribly odd, I have to pinch myself. I never really use it in, in, just, mm. you know, in ordinary yeah. things, but it's, um, it's something I have to tell you, I wondered whether I should even accept it because I thought it might make people think I'd become very grand or very different, and I knew I wasn't different, and I couldn't think why I'd even got it in the first place. So um, I said to my husband, do you think I should turn it down? And he said, no, because it's like being given a bunch of flowers. You take it and say thank you so much. <laughs> so that's what I did. How was your, did you, so you met the Queen, she was the one who... Gave you your dame? No, but she position. gave me my OBE back right, in, okay. in 1996, I think. This was Princess Anne. Oh, okay. It was right, thrilling, okay. yeah. Okay. And um, taking it right back to your childhood then, did you always know that you wanted to go into entertainment or was there ever a different career path no, I possibly? Think it was, I think it was. It was sheer laziness because I didn't want to work. <laughs> I thought anything rather than working is sort of I wanted to run away and join the circus. <laughs> yeah. um, I was very interested in everything and so I loved, I loved the idea. I was quite a tomboy. I loved mucking around and rushing about and climbing and doing things, you know. Um, and I just thought, I, I, I went on stage the first time when I was six. It was out in Malaysia. My father was at the army and we were out there with his regiment. <clears throat> and I remember being on stage terrified, but thinking, this is odd because I think this is where I belong in the future. And knowing then, and then of course I was in all the school plays and so mm -hmm. on, and just knew, come hook or by crook, whatever happened, I would probably end up acting. Yeah. And how were you spotted originally? I, I wasn't spotted. I was like a burglar. I literally forced windows open the back <laughs> and climbed to the lavatory window, you know, <laughs> muscled my way in. I'd been a model in the 60s because... Um, when I was at school, I auditioned for RADA and didn't get in. Mm. And qu quite rightly, I mean, I was not in any way a suitable candidate. But I was so set back by being turned down that I thought if I go to other drama schools and they also turn me down, then that might convince me that I shouldn't be an actress. Mm. And as I'm going to be an actress, let's you know, so la 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 la, let's do something else. And so for about three years, I was a photographic model, which was at the time of the swinging 60s and couldn't have been more fun or harder work. Mm -hmm. Very good training, funnily enough, for the film industry. Yeah. You learn about camera angles, about light, about positioning, about all kinds of things. And then I just thought, well, I will have to get an equity card. In those days, there were, it, it was a union with a closed shop. If you didn't have an equity card, you couldn't work. That was the end of it. Not in films, television, theatre, anything. But you couldn't get an equity card unless you'd been in repertory theatre for 42 weeks which of course you couldn't be in if you didn't have an equity card. So it was a chicken and egg thing, <laughs> did, not having been to drama school. Did it affect you then, the first knockback from RADA? Because that's quite a big name to be rejected yeah, by. Yeah, I was 16. It? I mean, there's no question I was going to get in. I think it was going to be the first of a run of things. Yeah. You know, when you suddenly think, hang on, this isn't the way. I also can't, I don't think I... Funnily enough, I think only, um, well... James Bond I got from, as it were, an audition and the Avengers, but I can't get things through auditions. I've literally, unless people give me the part, in which case I can do anything, <laughs> but the idea of trying to get the part, I, I haven't got it in me, I can't do it. So I'm useless at auditioning, <laughs> useless. Why is that? Scared? I don't know. Nerves? I just, no, it's not nerves, it's just I don't, I want to work with people, I want them to direct me, I can adapt it, I could do it with a French accent, I could, and just to stand up there and say, I've prepared this speech and then just say it, and the other funny thing is, is that having directed myself and produced, as well as acted, a lot of people are very good at auditions, but that was as good as they are. Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm. So you're not going to get much more. Yeah. So I don't trust auditions any more than I trust exams, which I think <laughs> is a complete waste of time. Uh -huh. um, children, <laughs> don't bother with exams. I promise you, once you leave school, nobody will ever ask about them. So just forget That's it. That's true. I can don't echo do those it, you know, And don't feel university is the answer, because it's not. <laughs> Life is the answer. <laughs> So to focus a bit more on James Bond, yeah. um, so the part came through an agent or...? Yes, um, I think that they were sh shuffling around. At that time that this was made, which I think we filmed it in 1968, so they'd been looking around since late 66, 67, 
And they were just sort of siffling through the kind of people who you would have on a Bond film. Now this was just to be one of Blofeld's lovelies. So they were looking for kind of pretty girls who might get a line, but that's all. And so it was quite normal to be going up for things like that. Just, I can't remember who was, I can't remember who was the casting um, agent for this one. It wasn't Maud Spector, but it was one of the big ones on whose books, you know, they'd just have you all and you'd just be sh shuffled in. And I went along to see Harry Saltzman when they were still in that South Audley, South Audley Square or place, I think it was. And he'd just arrived back after lunch, Mr. Saltzman getting out of his Rolls Royce black glasses on and going in and the lift had broken and his office was on the fourth floor. So I had to follow him up four flights of stairs. And Harry Saltzman wasn't a thin man. And when he got to his office, he got and sat down behind the desk and for about 30 seconds, he couldn't speak, he was out of <laughs> breath. And then he just said, you have the part. <laughs> so, I went out again. I didn't say a word. I just went away. So that was your audition? That was my audition. Walking up some stairs. Yeah. <laughs> Slowly behind you. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Yeah. It's a good job you don't like auditions. <laughs> yeah. And um, Peter Hunt, um, he's a very well respected for what he did on Majesties. Yeah. I mean, it, Majesties has, has grown in popularity. How, how was the reception of how do you remember the, the receptions of Majesties now compared to how it is now because it's even mentioned in the new Bond, Bond film hasn't it so. because Peter Hunt had been an editor this is the secret of everything you've got to have a writer and an editor and a director if you've got those you've got the foundations of something good and he's putting star actors in that means nothing if you haven't got a script and it means nothing if you haven't got people who understand how you can redeem performances you can make a performance if you're a good editor and Peter understood the pacing of a Bond film. And I think that it holds up against, lots of people put it in the top three, and some people say it's the top one. Mm. Of, of the action Bonds, it's as good as you get, I think. Mm. And of course, they're quite different from the amount of money, th they're always expensive to make, but nowadays the amount of money thrown at them is absolutely catastrophic. <laughs> In those days, the skill wasn't in so much in visual trickery. It was literally men skiing down mountains and the cameraman skiing backwards on very short corridor skis with two ends, looking at the terrain behind him and then holding the camera and skiing backwards as Olympic skiers skied towards him, dressed as Blofeld's awful men mm -hmm. with their machine guns. I mean, it was... It was all thrilling, it was all real, all the fights and the stock car racing on the ice and things. So you were on location at Piz Gloria. Yeah. How long were you? Was the we were shoot up there for you? two months. Really? Can you imagine that? Now you can play a lead part in a film, your name above the title, and be on it for two days. <laughs> then you're a tiny nobody, your name only listed in a bunch at the very end, and we were on it for two months. Wow. This is how it was. How filmmaking has changed, and so of course, of course, I remember all the names of all my co-stars co-stars, co-girl stars, the us, the mm -hmm. Bond girls, because we were all together for t two months. Mm -hmm. We lived in this great big hotel. Um, every morning we got up and put on all our stuff very early, caught the first cable car up, changed, caught the next cable car up, up to Pete's Gloria, where they always said, every day, girls, remember, not too much movement for the first half hour because you're at 10,000 feet up there. It was only about three or 4,000 above Mirren, but enough to make you a bit breathless. Yeah. So until you declimatized, you might be lightheaded. And then being up there and making friends with everybody, having a feeling of comradeship. They would show a film once a week in the Palace Hotel. They would black out the dining room and put a screen up. And we'd watch a movie. So there's a real feeling of being on location. Whereas now, of course, you're probably helicoptered in, do your bit. Don't meet other people. No. We met, of course, Telly Savalas and Ilza Stepat, who played 
Yeah, I'm a wood. Yeah. I was going to ask what, what was it like rig. to work because no one really mentions Ilsa Stepper Ilsa Stepper, she was so fabulous. Yeah. She was just one of those rock solid people who you've got to have in Bond films because they've got to be massively threatening, mm -hmm. really sinister people. And she was just a huge German, a, a German actress of tremendous status and mm -hmm. ability. I am Fräulein Irma Bund, personal secretary to the car. How do you do? Have you had a good journey? No, quite intolerable. I'm not a good traveller, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Can't have you take your luck? No, I can manage. I take it. Oh, really? How was George? George was... Do you know, I felt for George because... On one hand, he was James Bond, the most adorable, attractive, important man on the earth. The other... They said, you're only an Australian model. Who do you think you are? So one time they were saying, George, the helicopter's ready for you any time you want. You can go anywhere, do anything you want. And other times they'd just be going, who do you think you are? So it was a horrible combination for him. And he hadn't expected any of this, I think. Nobody can know how it's going to be with Bond. And he was working with Diana Rigg, who, of course, is an extremely distinguished Shakespearean actress. Mm -hmm and I think was found the whole thing slightly trying, as far as I can remember. Mm. But I do remember the first... We'd been working out there for maybe two or three weeks before Diana Rigg came out. And I'd made friends with, with George because he was just a great big kind Australian boy and he was teaching himself to play the guitar. And he was playing Hey Jude. He'd say, come on, Lamley, can you sing? I said, no, I can't. He'd say, well, I'm playing Hey Jude. <laughs> twing, twong, twing, million. He was just a nice, <clears throat> sweet, easy-going guy. Very good at, you know, he was fit as a flea. Mm -hmm. Kept all his training up. Was a very, he did his big fight in the, in the, um, the Belfry with, with uh, oh, what's the name of that gorgeous stuntman with a bald, bald head? Anyway, Yuri, I can't remember his name. Oh, yeah, uh, Yuri. Yuri, not Gagarin, obviously. Yuri, I can't remember his name. He was yeah. sensational, but they padded him, but they didn't pad George. There were little cruelties like that, where George was really black and blue with bruises. Yeah. But he was a sweet and a good man, but some of the girls were a bit, who does he think he is? But I liked him, he was a good friend. But was he a ladies' man then, as much as...? Not really, but I mean, mm. any, George, any handsome great lunk on a hillside when there are 12 girls <laughs> is kind of a ladies' man, but not really. Yeah. He was a friendly, friendly man. Yeah. He was yeah. good friends. But he was daunted by the idea of, of having to meet Diana Rigg. Yeah. Because I think her reputation had gone ahead of her, that she would not suffer fools gladly. Is it? They, there's been stories that they didn't really get on. Do you know He invited me to the first supper with you. He said, well, I mean, I've got to take her out to dinner. <laughs> Will you come with me? <laughs> so I went along, and Diana Rigg was there. And, of course, I was nothing. I was only a piece of dust in her eyes as well, because if kind of, I'd been a model, how, how much lower can you get? Because <laughs> to be a model in those days was considered... In the film world, nothing. Okay, right. you know, nowadays, you kind of go, oh, how lovely she's been a model. That's yeah, a marvellous big yeah. thing. In those days, it was a black mark against you. Yeah. So there she was with an Australian who she thought couldn't act. <laughs> and an insect, which was me. I think it's great for George that the uh, sort of the opinion amongst the Bond fandom, certainly, of Her Majesty's Secret Service has just seems to increase all the time. It, it, I think it's well regarded now as being... Yes, very much so. The, ...one of the best, <clears throat> if not the best. Yeah, and he Bond turned film. in a perfectly acceptable performance. You yeah. know, this idea yeah. of mocking him, and you go, well, what's, what's so funny about any of this? He actually did it very coolly. That was a quick conference. How do you expect a girl to keep herself alluring? Take a memo, please, Money Penny. Freddie James. Sir, I have the honour to request you will accept my resignation Effective forthwith. Resignation from what? Her Majesty's Secret Service. And kindly present us that monument in there. He looked he looked excellent. He carried yeah. himself easily. Um, and of course that brilliant trick of dubbing him while he was being Sir Hilary Bray. <laughs> Sir Hilary meets the girls. And there he came in speaking perfect English, but that was beautifully done by George Baker. Beautifully. Yeah. And that that match was very clever when they decided to to it was I thought it was a clever, good film. Yeah. Was he do you think he was a bit daunted by step because Sean Connery was probably arguably the biggest film star in the world at the time, wasn't he? Did you did you ever feel he he felt daunted by that or did he kind of take it in his stride replacing Sean? There was no real shadow of Sean over our film, okay. actually, I have to say that. I don't know how long it elapsed. You probably would know because you're clever at this than I am, but there'd been two a years. bit of a gap. It was two years. For the release date, it was two years. It would have been less filming, yeah. 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 Um, 
But remember, Sean had done two. He'd done um, four up to that point. Oh, had he? And then he came back and did one And did one after. more. So he'd done four. So he yeah. was James Bond. So then yeah. we knew he wasn't going to be James Bond. But remember, we come from an acting world where if a play is done again, if Shakespeare is done, if Hamlet is done again, there is a new Hamlet. Yeah. There's a new... The heroes are played by successive actors. So yeah. it didn't seem so weird. Now it's become kind of more iconic even than it was then. Now it's obsessive. Who's going to be bombed? Yeah. He'd and done people's five, opinions. Sorry, correct, you know. Five. So, yeah, <laughs> he'd done five. He'd done five. Yeah, he'd done he five. He did his six. Then, yeah. six and then I think he didn't want to go on anymore because of the money. He had I think enough, he thought he yeah, should the role and the stardom. And the role yeah. and yeah. stuff like that. And he was a fine actor, and so he wanted to spread his acting wings yeah, a bit. Yeah, sure. Whereas Bond doesn't really let you do that as much as other roles, let's yeah. put it like that. Yeah. Was there any hint that... George was going to stay on, he was going to leave. Did you ever get any feeling? Never that... had any idea. Remember, we were only a section of the film mm. and we weren't even towards the end of the film. So we, we weren't, it wasn't as though there was <clears throat> a feeling of, there was no sort of end of shoot party because we'd all gone. Yeah. They stayed on for another six months com completing the, the alpine skiing because of they had to wait for the snow and then do all that. So, that, so that, um, I don't think there was any sense of, you mean, all airheads in those days. Nobody, nobody had all this sort of obsession with the future and things. You just did stuff. Yeah, yeah do it. Yeah, what's that? Yeah. A film? Great. Got out of that. And you went into something else. Yeah. You don't kind of dwell on things or. I guess because they didn't so self-regarding. They didn't have an afterlife. Kind of now they're mm -hmm. streaming Blu-ray. Yeah, discs. they were actually a movie, was, and then they were gone. Yeah, it was just. It was yeah, just what it, it was. was. Just gone. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So moving forward a bit, there's a, a, a revisit to the spy genre with the character of Purdy. Um, in the new Avengers, yeah, um, and a role that was iconic. I think um, I spoke to my mother before I came to see this, and she mentioned wanting the haircut, oh, bless um, her. which I think was was quite famous at the time. It was. Uh, how did that role come about? The role came about again, like any of these things, where you're put. You know, a million people are going through, and they can't kind of see the right one. Can't see the right one. That was one I said where I said. They went, oh, I don't know, thank you for coming. I said, no, you have to test me. Will you screen test me? Will you give me a screen test? Because I had, in that odd way where you can see shadows falling forwards and backwards, um, I knew that the part would be mine, and I couldn't see that they couldn't see that it was going to be mine. Yeah. So I said, will you test me? Will you just do a screen test? And they were kind of taken aback by this vehemence and said, all right. Um, by that, I had hair slightly longer than this and sort of brownish when I was there. But when I got the part, I knew that uh, I would. I stu studied the idea of this rather cold little sort of agent policewoman, professional little person. Didn't one well, not in love with anybody? You know, tough as a man. Didn't suffer fools gladly either. And I thought she'd have no nonsense hair. She'd have her hair cut off. Yes. So I said, I'm going to have my hair cut off. They went, No, you're not. You've never. There's no heroine with short hair. And I said, bad luck, Joan of Arc. But I mean, <laughs> the, I, I said, this is, I think it's ideal. And they said, well, look, we don't think it's going to work. So what you've got to do is be prepared to pay for having a wig made, which is terribly okay. expensive. And I was poor as a rat. In <laughs> um, and then if we don't like it, you have to wear the wig and look after it, maintain it yourself. So I said, OK, well, you'll like the haircut. And I went to John Frieda, yeah. who, was <laughs> only a, who was only an assistant at the time. Oh, really? And his oh. assistant carrying the Kirby Crips and sweeping the floor was Nicky Clark. Oh, wow. so this was right at the beginning yeah. of all their careers as well. No way. And got this short, short haircut, which I'd seen on another girl, short, like a boy at the back, you know. And luckily it worked. Luckily they liked it and, and it was good. So that haircut became the Purdy. So you must have been walking around London seeing everyone trying to copy your haircut. What <laughs> was Remember, that like? I was never walking around London. I was always filming. I was on mm. first up every every day for two years. Yeah. So by the time the show was going out, I never saw it. Right. I never really was with people. 
Um, but lots of people had it in London. In Holland, they became upset. It became almost compulsory. I think everybody had it yeah. in Holland. I got off a plane. I was doing something. I'd been flown in to do some big thing because it was huge in parts of the world. It was huge in Holland, huge in South Africa, where they had had an embargo on any television shows. And so they only had sort of 17-year-old I Love Lucy mm. and this. And so they used to even close Parliament for when it went out. It was the thing. Wow. That's the only time I've really tasted what fame is like. It was there. Right, OK. Where they f had outriders and bodyguards and entire floors at hotels. It was dreadful. Did you screen test with Patrick McNee? No, you did with your... Gareth Hunt. Oh, with Gareth Hunt. Patrick was... Patrick was immortal. Yeah. And so they really wanted to see if the, if the two new sidekicks, because they'd never had a man in it before. No. It was always Patrick and somebody. But Pat didn't want to do it. I was a long time after, you see, it was Honor Blackman, then it was Diana Rigg, then it was Linda Thorson, who people forget, and she mm. did more than all of us put together. Mm. Yeah, and she yeah. was very young. She was 19 when she had the part. And I think that hadn't really worked because I think people felt that the gap, the age gap between her was so great. Mm. And Pat didn't want to do any more fighting. He didn't really ever do anything, but he wanted not to have to do any of that action stuff. So that was when they brought in the idea of a man as well. Right. Gareth yeah. Hunt. Ah. Well, don't stand there panting, Tibbet. Start the unpacking. Here, let me help Yes, you. sir. Oh, thank you, sir. You must have worked with a lot of potential Bonds to replace Daniel Craig. Who is your pick? To I replace don't pick. Daniel I Craig? couldn't, and I wouldn't, and I know, having simpered around in front of Barbara Broccoli for a thousand years, going, <laughs> any chance of anything, Barbara? Just, I could just be a tea woman. I could just be a secretary, somebody who pours water. Mm -hmm. Little half cold eyes pass over. <laughs> Not going to get there. Mm. But all the kind of people, and I think that maybe. This is my opinion. I think that Ian Fleming wrote about a particular kind of man who's actually quite cruel. And when he describes him, uh, he describes this hard, hard-faced, anonymous kind of creature, somebody who could fit in. Mm -hmm. Now, we've heaped our love on Bond so much that we want him to be everything to all people. Yeah. But actually, he was, he was a spy. He's an agent, we've got to remember this. Very, very fit, um, very ruthless, very cruel. And so I know a lot of actors who could have done it, but who wouldn't be acceptable in the world's way of having to have some dazzling hero. Yeah. I think a lot of people could, could play Bond, actually. Yeah. And I think that I, when they say, could it be a woman, you go, well, the clue's in the name. He's called James Bond. If you want to write a different show about a woman doing it, do, by all means. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, funnily enough, in, in the, um, I think uh, Matt Damon has stolen a lot of the thunder in his great sh films. You know, he's been completely brilliant, almost Bond-like in his films. <laughs> There is definitely a lot more competition now in terms of, you know, Mission Impossible and Jason Bourne and these, you know, know. there's a lot. Um, there's but a, there's a always lot of very room for some film. extraordinary hero with extraordinary things going on and extraordinary enemies. Remember in the old days, it was very easy to have enemies because the Russians, the Chinese, mm -hmm. you know, Blofeld. But now it's considered very poor show to have any real enemies. So they're left kind of spiralling around climate change and things, of course. Which, which is a bit like fighting clouds. So they have to invent something i mean i suppose ai would be the next will be the next yeah. thing yeah wouldn't it? yeah and if you were to come back to the series would you like to play m a, a villain i a... must be the only person on the planet who in skyfall when judy dench beautifully and tragically died and, you know and i was going yes that's me <laughs> barbara <laughs> <laughs> too late yeah. ray finds have got yeah. it <laughs> Well, if they're doing a reboot for the next, you never know. <laughs> well, who knows? Who ever knows? The Wolf of Wall Street. Oh. What was it like working with Martin Scorsese? Oh, it, well, what a hero. You can't really, that's the one that makes your heart beat and beat and beat. He is, 
extraordinary. He's immaculately dressed, I should say that, at all times, immaculate. He's phobic about a lot of things, about smoking, about air, about germs, about flying, about crowds, about this, about that. So he hates a lot of things, but he liked me, which was lovely. <laughs> and so I was allowed from the tent to the inner tent, to the inner inner tent, to the inner sanctum, to the capo di capi. You know, you're just taken through so many barriers in mm -hmm. to meet him. And he, he was so amusing, so light, so generous, so sweet. But he's seen every film that's ever been made in any language anywhere in the world since time began. Mm -hmm. He's a geek. He mm -hmm. makes you boys look like biggies. <laughs> <laughs> and you're pretty geeky to me. Thanks. <laughs> I'd say that's a compliment. That's a compliment, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, he could, he, there's literally practically no film you could mention without him immediately yeah. accessing it and in his brain, like a kind of brrrr, it, the files flick through and yeah, yeah. pop it up in his head. Extraordinary man. Yeah. Um, and I was th thrilled, but heart beating, to meet him. I think he wanted me. Not, he, he, he might have been anxious that I might look a bit. A lot of people after Patsy thought that was all I could do, and that was all I could look like mm -hmm. with masses of red lips and eye shadow and uh, eye lashes and so on. Um, so this, this, it was lovely when I could just be a dowdyish piano teacher in, living in London. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't fly to London, so that scene was right. shot in Brooklyn, pretending to be Hyde Park. Right. But the one I was really frightened to meet was Leonardo DiCaprio, because I'd admired him for so long, and I was terrified he'd be a Hollywood brat. I thought he would be unbearable, and all my admiration for him would kind of be crinkle and crankle. He was the most courteous, charming, generous, open-hearted, humble, lovely man, lovely, lovely man. So it was a fabulous time. And have you um, any strange fan experiences apart from me and Johnny today? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but um, I think that what's interesting is because I've been around for so long and I loved it because you said that you talked to your mother before this. <laughs> and my mum, I was going to I'm so <laughs> grateful you didn't say your grandmother. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a sort of, because I've been around for so long, and I've been lucky enough to be in one or two quite memorable things, the New Avengers, to a certain extent, Staff Iron Steel, which a lot of people still have childhood memories of, and, and Bond, and then travel shows, and absolutely fabulous. So people from all ages have remembered me for different things. Yeah. So quite often a fan is just as likely to come up to me and say, well, what was it like in Uzbekistan, as they might say, what was it like working with Jennifer Saunders? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you can get all you can get all these different yeah, things. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. How did you find talking of, about Abfab? We we can't not mention it. Mm. Um, how did you find the transition to comedy? Because you'd not. Well, I'd you... only started in comedy. I was only ever a clown, and right. I was astonished to be cast in these po faced girl, girlfriend <laughs> roles. Dull, you know. But I had to earn a living, so you just do do whatever you're given. But I was always a comedian. Um, so it was, it was magic, it was like having the lid. First of all, I did Ruby Wax, a wild, z wild zany shows, mm. where you played a sort of parallel version of yourself going to the dogs, just literally rotting away in front of your eyes. Then doing Ab Fab, where Patsy could be so unbearably disgusting, <laughs> with all her organs removed and, you know, living mm. off sort of something awful and things, you know, just drink and smoke. <laughs> 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 she was so funny. I mean, Jennifer was such a wonderful, again, generous and brilliant writer. Were, were you, were you always kind of? Did you have to audition for that, or was it always that? No, she, that's you. No, she, well, she gave it to me. I don't think. I think we it, the character of, of Patsy didn't really exist on the page, and it was Adrian Edmondson, Jennifer's husband, who said, "Why don't she use Joanna Rumley?" Right. Okay. So I don't think it was Jennifer's idea because she hadn't really. I hadn't really worked out for herself. She knew who Adina would be, but not quite how Patsy would be. Yeah. And so I, I kind of grew, grew, invented a kind of Patsy oh, that right, would okay. be. Yeah. I read, um, looking at talking about Sapphire and Steel, that there was um, a discussion at one time about you potentially being the Doctor. Is there any truth in that? It, it's, well, it, it, the papers all said, oh, you know how papers ca catch a little thing, like a dog catching a bone and running with it. Um, but I was a doctor in a, co in a comic relief sketch. And so a lot of Whovians now write to me and say, first woman, can you write underneath it, first woman doctor, <laughs> first female doctor? Because they see me as my little part where Jonathan, no, somebody had turned into something. Da um, I think 
I think Hugh Grant then uh, morphed into me when, you know, doctors reinvent themselves mm -hmm. and come up. And I think several of those came up. Rowan Atkinson, I think, turned into Hugh Grant, who turned into me. <laughs> and so you grew up in India. You was born there. No, I was born in India, but I grew up in, in really in the Far East, in Hong Kong and right, Malaysia. Okay. So what was your childhood like there? And tell us about how it inspired you to, for the Gurkhas, your work with the Gurkhas. Well, my father was with the Gurkha Regiment, and he yeah. was a regular soldier, which meant that he'd fought them all during the war, but then also afterwards in, in various areas of conflict around the world. Um, growing up in the Far East made you quite unprepared for being in this country because everything was hot. I was cold. I think I'm still cold in this country. Mm -hmm. I, I never got over how cold it yeah, was there. Yeah. Everything was bright, vivid, sudden. Storms rolled up and were massive. Rain came down, flattening you. Flowers would open and close in one day. Everything was extreme. The scents, the flavours, the spices, everything was gorgeous. And travelling, we then packed and left, packed and left. You'd go to a school, you make friends, you'd pack and leave, pack and leave. So I got used to travelling, and I think that's quite interesting and important for roles in as I was saying, on things like Bond, where you make good, close friends, but also in the theatre, where you live as a family for three months, six months, however long it is, and then suddenly that close family sh shatters, and you might not see some of the people ever again, mm -hmm. some not for two or three years, and it's this odd travelling on feeling, which I feel I'm better at now. Mm -hmm. So it didn't unsettle you as a child, being moving no. around like that? Children, t children tend to take the status quo. Children don't have an idea of what ought to be. Mm. Mm. And as we'd never lived in England, I didn't think of, I mean, it was, it's typical in the forces that you always say you're going home on leave. And home was always the British Isles somewhere. But my family hadn't lived in England for generations, so we didn't have a home here. Mm -hmm. So eventually my parents, when my father did leave the army, bought a house in Kent. But we didn't have any kind of roots in England. I mean, I'm, I'm British, obviously. I'm actually three quarters Scottish. But, uh, but, but we, don't, we didn't have a home here, mm -hmm. but it's my home now. When I first came to London, I remember it was for a ballet exam, and I'd been at a little boarding school in Kent. We came up on the train to do an exam up at Sadler's Wells or something. And I looked out from Charing Cross, the window out, and I thought, I don't know where this is, but it's going to be my home now. It's going to be my city. Did that sort of movement early on in your life inspire the, the travel work that you've, that you've done? Uh, I think it sows the seeds. Yeah. I think it sows the seeds because, of course, Already I'd become not only used to, but uh, admiring of and accepting of different languages, different cultures, different looks, different religions, different, uh, different everything was completely normal. So that's, that's why it feels like the world, you get quite, I've always thought the world is mine anyway. You know, I've never thought any of us, are, you should be there, you should be there. Mm. You can go anywhere. Yeah. Actually, it's only human beings who've invented these weird boundaries and pass, mm. passports and you can't come here and particular l lookist kind of things. You don't look as though you belong here and all that rubbish. So I never really had that. And I've, I've sort of, I carried that with me. So wherever I am, I love it. As soon as I get there, I just go, oh, well, I love this. Mm. Mm. And what have you been up to recently and what, what's in the pipeline for you coming? I've been filming away, and we've been doing it since February, a great eight-part Netflix um, series, which is uh, Harlan Coben, who's one of the great thriller writers. Uh, his books are page-turners. And this is, if you can call it a, a series, a page-turner, that's what it is. You go, oh, no, well, who could it be? Oh, no, oh, my God. Oh, and so quite a lot of that goes on, right until the last scene, and then you go, oh, no. And they're so funny because they're, they're almost as grand as the Bond films. They didn't send us the last episode. I'd read the book, but, you know, things always change slightly when you book the translation. And uh, they didn't, they kept the last episode under wraps until about two or three weeks ago, and you go, sneaky. And that, you, would, that would be out on New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. Midnight. Midnight to 170 countries, all eight episodes. <laughs> and it's called Fool Me Once. Okay. Yeah. We look out for that. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to mention I have a guilty pleasure for Jonathan Creek, and you starred yeah. in one of my favourite episodes. I loved that. Yeah, that was... How was that? It was it, it, fascinating. It had Sheridan Smith in it. Yes. It had um, Rick Mail in it. It, it was extraordinary. Who's, I was somebody's wife. 
Isn't it funny? We forget. Yes, we... Um, from the young ones. Um, it was Rick Mail. It was Rick Mail. Was that his wife? No, it was the other uh, Nigel. Oh, Nigel Pl Planer. Yeah. Nigel Planer. Rick Mail was the other police officer. Rick Mail yeah. was the police officer. It was Nigel Planer. Uh, uh, it was they are again beautifully thought out, very well written, and they spend a great deal of time and trouble on getting it right. And it was, it was good fun to do. It's yeah. always nice working with a good script, good actors, good kind director. I do remember at one point I had to be dead on the ground in the snow, and it was real snow, and I had to be dead on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> a bit yeah. challenging. <laughs> Could you not have got a stunt lady to fill in for you? For <laughs> no. <them>? no. <laughs> <laughs> and what's um. What's left for you ambition-wise? Is there anything you haven't done that you really want to do? Everything. I think nobody ever sits back and thinks, well, I've what I do feel grateful for is, is the fantastic life I've had. Because even though lots of it has been, I've made more pathetically you know, non-memorable programmes and films than almost anybody on their planet. It doesn't matter. You make good friends. You laugh at it later. It's all good. It's all good training. Because if you can make a really bad script work a bit, You've done well. Yeah. To work with a good director and a fine script is flying. It's easy peasy. It's like walking on this table. But if you're floundering with bad everything, um, you've got to make something work. And that's where you develop your acting muscles, as it were. So I've had a wonderful life as an actor, a forgiving life. They've, they've, I'm, I'm still working. Mm -hmm. um, I've loved my travel things mixing in. And of course, I've done a lot of different things as well. I've written. And I've appeared and still do radio shows. I've got a lovely radio show, Conversations from a Long Marriage, and I'm doing another six with Roger Allen, who's one of the actors I've always adored. So we've got all, all these things go on. And then the travel shows, which I suppose until I literally dragged about on, a, on a, some old you know, wheelchair or something, <laughs> I shall continue to do. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> um, in the uh, sort of comedy shows of the early sort of 2000s there was a lot of sort of impressionists and I remember you were quite often taken off <laughs> on impression shows well, sorry. Um, <laughs> how, I wondered how, how that was to sort of see people well, impersonating you <laughs> oh, it, it's always lovely it doesn't matter how badly or horribly do they do it you know it's rather like people saying no publicity is bad publicity it's that kind of thing if anybody thinks you're worth mm. either mocking or taking off or just spoofing that's, that's... You've made it. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The interesting thing now, actually, which we ought to talk about, particularly with James Bond, I mean, not talk about it, I'm just going to mention here, is AI. Because now they've become so adept at sampling our looks and our voices mm -hmm. that they can make Bond any... They can make anybody Bond. Yeah. They can make anything. Mm -hmm. And the actors are all going, I'm not sure this is great. And I think that people like Scorsese have come out against it saying, funny enough, as people, what we like to see is people. Whenever you see CGI, my mind just goes, it doesn't matter if I see a million orgs running with axes raised, it doesn't make my heart beat faster at all. Mm -hmm. But if you watch real people doing things, that's when you fall in love with them. Yeah. That's when you are terrified of them. That's when films really catch. But I'm anxious about AI because I think they're going to use it more and more. Some of the things that they've done, um, uh, I think in Star Wars, um, they, they used uh, the actor who, who's no longer with us, but they, they yeah. made it look like he was there on one of yes. the newer films, and they did it with Donald Pleasance in yeah, the they did that very well, screen yeah. film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Halloween. Um, Halloween film, yeah. sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's interesting, because I don't know whether Donald himself would have liked somebody who, to have worked out what he would have done. Do you, yeah. you never know, it's, do you? You yeah. almost don't own yourself. Yeah, I was yeah. very shocked during, somebody had used my face during an advertisement which I like to do with me, and I asked about it and said, this is passing, it's called passing off as, which means that you use a picture of, it can be anybody, Marilyn Monroe, and have her holding this up and saying, I use this. And you go, well, she didn't do that. Mm. You go, oh, no, it's not, wasn't Marilyn, it was somebody who looked like her. It's yeah. passing off. And I asked about it, and they said, but you don't own your likeness. That I never knew. Yeah. I don't own this. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that weird? It must be weird, scary, yeah. yeah. That's so weird. Yeah. And you, you do a lot, of, you support a lot of charities, don't you? Mm. What, what kind of feelings does that give you to know you're helping people? Uh, charities is an sort of odd word because all it is is helping people, and people saying, we need this. And sometimes charities saying, I've just been to this place, and what they really need is a school, a hospital, some pencils, some food. 
what they need is clean water, what they need is this or that, or what they need is a safe place, whatever. And usually they come to you and say, do you think you can help? And you go, sure, sure I can help if I can. And that's all it is. Mm. So um, as your head is above the parapet, more people come to you because they recognize you and say, this is our problem, this is what's happening here, could you help? And sometimes the only help you can bring is to bring the spotlight of publicity to a mm -hmm. cause, which they wouldn't, I mean, if the Princess of Wales endorses something, the press will come and look at what it is. Yeah. If not, the perfect example of this was the, was the late Princess of Wales, Diana, mm -hmm. with the landmines. Of course. Mm -hmm. A lot of us have been working about trying to get landmines banned for ages before that. But then she went along, and then the press took interest. Until then, they weren't interested. So you've got to, it's a sort of odd line you've got to tread. You've got to try to get the story of this sadness. But unfortunately, the world is in such t tumult at the moment. It's hard to know. And one su place succeeds the other in horror and how much we can help it. But do, as I would say, you in your small corner, I in mine, do what you can, that's mm. all. Yeah. How have you seen, since you've... So working with the Gurkhas and how have you seen the, them progress, like the input you've made? How have you seen the charities the develop? Oh, yeah, the charities just, and just, yeah, Gurkhas oh, and the charities. other charities. Well, yeah. all the charities. I mean, when you think of things like Comic Relief and, um, and Live Aid, before, funny enough, before Bob Geldof, giving to charity was considered not a very rock and roll thing to do. Really? Nobody did it. Blimey. Nobody did it. And there were very few people doing it. Then suddenly he made it the coolest thing on the planet. Mm. And he started it being cool. After that came Comic Relief. After that, it became a cool thing for everybody to do. Sportsman, everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew it was rock and roll to support charity. And so then no wonder they call him Saint Bob. Mm -hmm. I think the world of him. Yeah, because he's famous rent on... Live Aid when yeah. he's banging the table. Yeah. That's very, yeah, that's very famous now. That probably yeah. made it cool. And nobody it? had ever heard anybody saying, realizing to speak with such passion about people who desperately needed yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, mm. swearing live on TV back in there oh. probably was a bit of a. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> got anything else? No, he's got nothing. You've literally, I've talked you out of it. <laughs> it's um, been so got, sweet of you. Oh, actually, go I've on. Got one yeah, go on. Um, if you had to pick, this might be a really hard question, uh, the absolute pinnacle of your career so far, if you could pick one thing, could you pick something? No. Could you pick, no? I couldn't. I could pick moments of all kinds of things. Yeah. I could pick the moment that I knew I'd been chosen for the Avengers when you suddenly go, my life will change now. Instead of just being somebody's girlfriend for 60 quid in an episode or something. Yeah. Not that I would make money, but I knew that then I would be, my name would never be forgotten doing Patsy and getting any recognition from, for instance, BAFTA for that, getting a BAFTA for Patsy. When I had been turned down by RADA, I was so then pleased. So incidentally, you could make a wonderful thing about the people who RADA have turned down, mm -hmm. all kinds yeah. of unbelievable people. Yeah, of so yeah. I kn you never should feel ashamed of being turned down. Yeah. Um, yes, meeting Mr. Scorsese, yes, all kinds of things like that. But you never feel proud and think, oh, well, I've done that. Mm -mm -mm. I'm so pleased. Because you're always looking at the next thing. People like Judy Dench, well, even Judy Dench will say, I could have done that better. I could have. You, you mm. watch it and you go, oh, no, really? No, that's not too bad. Oh, ah, come on. So you're never, you know, you're always critical about your own work. And do you, do you enjoy watching yourself? No. <laughs> Sometimes you do if you've, if you've got to if you maybe are doing another accent or if you're doing something or you wanted to see how a particular scene will be edited, you see it's difficult on film because you give your stuff. They can edit it. They can chop it into whatever they like. So that's what you look to see, how much of your speech they've done on the back of your head. Yeah. <laughs> Over yeah, shoulder yeah, to yeah, the main yeah. star. And you go, I see, I see yeah. what you've done there. All you can do is your best. And then throw it up. Don't get too obsessed with yourself. Work hard. That's all we've got to do. Actors are like jobbing workers, you know what I mean? If somebody said to me, we're going to paint this room mauve, you'd go, OK. I wouldn't have chosen mauve, but I will paint it mauve okay, to yeah. the best of my ability. Yeah, yeah, okay, That's what right. actors are. When we interviewed Julian Glover, I, I asked him if he still has to audition. And he says, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't, Julian Glover has to audition. He said, the only person in the, in the only act, actor who doesn't have to audition is Dame Judi Dench, mm. you see, because she's simply the greatest actress the world's ever known. But 
you don't like auditions, but you you have to audition for some things, I presume. But how do you how do you do well, with I don't, them? Then? Funny enough, I don't really do it. Not I don't do them. People tend to give me the part. Right, tend okay, to offer me the right, part. Okay. Um, but if you work for America, it's as if they say they. It's as if you've never worked in your life and they say could you show us some anger i'd like to see a little bit of vulnerability here could we see something you go they, you've got me here because you've loved my work yeah, yeah what is it that you think that i should now do yeah. so they quite often want an almost finished performance in some sort of audition piece and people are getting more and more rattled by this because you have to rig up your own camera then you have to have the lines and sometimes they send you pages of lines which you're supposed to have learnt or glue on the screen or get somebody to read the other part in. You c it's, it's vile, mm. these camera auditions that you have to do yourself. I never mind going to meet people. Quite often they want to see you because you might have changed from when they last saw you or in the last thing they saw and admired you might have been wearing a wig mm -hmm. or you might have been wearing padding or you might have been that big. So they, don't, they want to see the cut of your jib, as it were. Mm. So I can understand that. Yeah. How do you deal with doing accents about getting them right? Do you worry? Do you, do no, you don't. Well, you listen. You get you get a good language uh, tutor to yeah. do it. But more often than not, people choose me because of what I sound like. And you yeah. go, God. and sometimes you, I go, look, I th I'm doing this. You've written she's Dutch. Can I do it with a Dutch? And they said, no, no. You go, oh, no, don't make me be me again. <laughs> So you've, quite often they choose me because I sound like I do. Because you probably have got one of the most distinctive it's voices ever. funny, you never hear ever. yourself. You never hear yourself. Yeah, you do, yeah, mm. yeah. Well, it's been absolutely incredible listening to your life and career, Joanna, so it's thank you so much. It's been such fun very talking good, to so. you both. Thank you very much. And thank um, you. Yeah, if you enjoyed the interview with um, Joanna, please donate uh, to Richard House Children's Hospice. I'll add the link um, to the end of the article. So Dame Joanna Lumley, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. <laughs>